um, I'm going to want to add a quick outreach update, and then we're going to do a short executive session to talk about personnel matters. So um, those items will be added to the agenda. We can slot, I think, both committees and the um, outreach update into the board discussion. Uh, why don't we do it after the uh, the CBCC presentation. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. Uh, do we have any public comment? Um, none from here. Uh, looks like we don't have any on Zoom. So uh, moving to consent agenda, do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So, uh, I'll move to approve the consent agenda, but I'd like to pull the superintendent report and the draft October 20th agenda. Okay. And then I think we should, we're supposed to add officially the superintendent evaluation committee meeting minutes from September 24th. Okay. To the consent agenda. And I have a question about the warrants because I didn't see them come through. They're in front of me. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, yeah, I got those today, and I it was I just didn't send them off. I'm sorry. That's a, that's okay. Maybe you maybe we could just pass them around. Well, I guess Rhett and Kristen wouldn't get to. We should probably pull them. No, leave them. Do we need to approve them. So I, oh yeah, you have to sign them, don't you? Yeah. We do have a quorum without Kristen and Rhett. Yeah, Look, maybe we can all put our eyeballs on them just to well, unless there's any questions. Have them with you? Maybe yeah, you can I can I. I I can email them right now. No, good. Perfect. Yeah, no, Perfect. I can just um, show them on Zoom. Yep. Okay, so then we'll leave them on the consent agenda. I'm not pulling those off. So that was my motion. I'll second the motion. Well, the, the, sorry. Should we pull them for two minutes because we have not seen them? And so then we can at least see them. So I don't want to prove something. I don't. I'll <laughs> even though things. I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Oh, thank so you. So we'll pull those. <laughs> uh, right, I'll pass these around. This so one just looks like you've got it up on your computer. Mm -hmm. Let me just email them. Okay, cool. I am going hard copy tonight. Yes, so, uh, so yeah, I can that, that is so over. retro. <laughs> I'm very impressed. That was my aim. Uh, <laughs> And then there's a second one. Okay. I need to vote on the motion. Yes. Um so did the motion include these or no? It did yeah. not. Okay. So let's vote on the first motion um, to approve everything except four items, the two warrants and the superintendent's report and draft agenda. You want to pull the superintendent's report? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's what he said, except for. Yes, all right. All right. Um, did we have a second? A second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, so discussion on, well, any discussion on the, well, let's move on. Any discussion on the warrants first? Does anyone have any questions? No. No. Um, so the superintendent's report or draft agenda, which we want to start with? Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, Libby, if, you know, given the understaffing that is still happening and the survey of the, the need for people, people power on surveillance testing, if volunteers would help at all, or if it would actually cause more work because you'd have to train with the volunteers. And if 
the, if possibly those positions aren't allowed to be filled by volunteers because of contractual reasons, or if there's, I guess I'm just asking if, if it would be helpful to have volunteers temporarily to fill in to keep things moving. Yeah, thanks, Mia. We're going to actually talk about staffing and executive session a little bit more. Okay. Um, uh, actually, the, the surveillance testing, we now have two substitute nurses coming in. One was sick this past Monday, which is why I still did it on Monday. Okay. But we, we do have two substitute nurses that we've hired to do the surveillance testing. And I, th I think we can get that covered with those two very capable people the the challenge with volunteers is just what you said it's somebody has to organize it and that somebody is me <laughs> and right now I, I don't have the capacity to organize volunteer corps okay. um, so so it's stuff we're gonna we're gonna talk about it in executive session okay and then for the uh, October 20th agenda I just had noted that we had been doing committee updates but they'd kind of fallen off the agenda and I was just asked wondering if we can get them like on a rotating basis to get those back on the agendas. Yeah, thanks for the reminder on that. I just had com I completely spaced on that, so thanks for yeah. the reminder. No yeah, problem. As did I, but that is that is a great reminder. So we will add. Um, does any committee want to volunteer to be up on the twentieth? We could Okay, let's. Do well, uh, unless there's somebody else that has more pressing. Yeah. We do have. A, I think we're gonna do on this one. Right? For the equity. Equity? Do you think we'll be ready by then with a thing? Yeah. Wow. Because mm. we're sending it to policy first, aren't we? <laughs> are we? I think we are. Okay. Right. We'll be ready in a little bit, but not by the time. Yeah. Right. You um, can have it. Any other committees interested in giving an update? We're going to meet, finance committee is going to meet like an hour before the next meeting. So we could give, we an, could update. give an update. Okay. Why don't we do finance committee? Yeah, why don't we finance committee? That'll be kind of a good free cursor to the budget season, too. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, so we will include that on the 20th. Uh, so now I need a motion to approve. Well, any further discussion on this, Joanne? And are we also approving now the superintendent committee, evaluation committee minutes? That was in the first motion. Okay. Yes. We added it in the first motion. Okay. So now I need a motion to approve superintendent's report and the draft agenda. And the two warrants. And the two warrants, yes, thank you. Um, I move, yes, to approve the superintendent's report and the draft agenda for October 20th and the two warrants. And do you have a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I just wanted to make sure that that. Brett and Kristen are both watching. I'm watching you. Yes. I am I am eyeing. Yes. You're eyeing. Yes, and you're also not opposing. So if if they're on Zoom, do you have to roll call them for the meeting? I don't believe so. I think the roll call was just for an all Zoom meeting. Zoom meeting? Yeah. Um but you guys do have your audio on, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. And we, we can hear you. Uh, so learning, uh, focus, and board discussion. Um, so Jill and Jill, thank you for being yes. the board representative on this. Um, and Jody, who's the um, Central Vermont Career Center director. Um, and Jody, you're willing. You're welcome to take that seat. It has a microphone. It might be a little, okay. a little easier for the folks who are watching or participating by Zoom to hear you. Um, yeah. So go ahead. And Do you want me to sit with you? I'm sure. Okay. Nice. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. So I am from Central Vermont Career Center and I've been blessed to work with Jill over the summer from since my start on July 1st, um, Emma, since I moved from U32 to the Career Center. And we wanted a chance to update you on our governance work so that you could know a little bit of what's coming up for us, what we've been working on and where we might be going next. And Libby, if you could 
move it forward. So in case you don't know, the Central Vermont Career Center is currently located at the back side of Spalding High School. And we serve here, Cabot, Harwood, Spalding, Twinfield, and U32 students in our center. We have lots of great programs from automotive to culinary, emergency services, natural resources, wonderful things that kids have been doing. Just this week, our uh, building trades built six tables for picnic tables for outside at Spalding and at Barrytown Elementary to give kids more space outside to eat lunches and not have to be inside. Our natural resources have been working with Bear Roots Farm. And so if you've been at the market, you've probably got purchased something that they've picked and they gleaned tomatoes this week for the food shelf. So lots of great things that our students are doing together from all of those sending schools at CVCC. Go ahead. The committee that's been working on governance and basically we belong, we belong to Barry Unified Union School District. We always have when we were the vocational school at Barry and Barry Tech Center and now Central Vermont Career Center. And this committee of great folks, including Jill, has been working together for at least a half a year. I don't know, is it longer? I think you're right. First meeting was April. Okay, so for half a year, a little bit before I came on board, working to decide, should we separate from the Barry School District and move forward in a way that allows all of our sending regions to give us support and to also vote on our budget and contribute to what happens. Right now we have a regional advisory board. And so there's a member of each sending school on that regional advisory board and the superintendents and principals often are part of that work as well. And they help approve and push the budget forward that we, that Barry ultimately, the Barry school board ultimately decides on right now. And so we hope that in the future, all school boards we'll have those representatives on our board. So one appointed member from each of the Sunny School Boards and some at-large members to make up a 10 member group together who make that budget and all of the voters from all of our 18 towns who contribute. Go ahead, Libby. I'm getting ahead of myself, so. <laughs> So we're working on what would be the Central Vermont Career Center School District. We've been working on the Articles of uh, Agreement, which is very similar to what you would have done when you came together with Roxbury and what many of our sending school districts have done recently and our bylaws for the new district. Go ahead. So as I was starting to say, we would have 10 members on our board, four at large from our largest district, which means Montpelier would have one. And the other six would be appointed from the Sending School District, similar to what sits on our regional advisory board now. Votes for the new governance, if to be selected, would happen at town meeting across all 18 towns, and so would the voting for those four at-large members. The current plan for our teachers, it, should we separate, should we get that support, would be to retain the current contract that they have under the Barry Education Association until that runs out and then they would negotiate with us. Go ahead. You'll notice also that every slide has a photo from one of our programs, those are from this year. So wanted to just be able to share what we're doing as well. So our next step, we've basically finished drafting our bylaws and articles of agreement. And once they've been perused by Pietro Lynn, um, whom you've all probably heard of, and brought back to our committee on our next meeting, which is October 19th. If we approve them, it then gets submitted in this report to the Agency of Education and the State Board to make a decision of, yes, can we move forward We're looking for this vote or no? So we may not move forward. It may get stuck there. However, should they decide to move us forward, we will then be putting together a ballot for every town across all of our sending schools to vote for us to create this new district or not, and to vote for those four at-large members.
So I've been reaching out to town clerks, all 18 town clerks across the districts. I've gotten a few questions and thankfully Carol Dawes in Barry City who will be the place where they bring all the ballots on, on that town meeting night to be counted really knows what needs to happen and has sent me great questions and followed up with great ideas to share with those town clerks. So they're they're starting to get an idea of what it is. First, there were a couple of them that sent back and said, this isn't us, this is Barry, or shouldn't you be talking to Harwood or Montpelier? And so then I would respond and call and talk to them. And we all are on the same page now. So I think that's a good step. If approved by all the 18 towns, then our transition board would be the appointed and elected members. And they would prepare to open our new district on July 1st of next year. Separate from this, there's been a revisioning committee also working to consider whether our current space is appropriate. If you've read any of the articles in the Times Argus in the last couple of months, you'll know that we had over 350 applicants for the Career Center. We had two, 231 slots to fill, and we started the year with 207. Part of that is because you might have a program that has 16 seats like automotive and 60 applicants. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna meet that need right now with that 16 seats. The other piece is we just don't have enough space to make our programs bigger. In some cases, the programming that we would like to offer like welding, we don't have the capacity to do it in the building given the current structure of the building and the air systems and, and just height of ceilings and all sorts of stuff like that. So we're looking into whether or not we can use that space and some other buildings around the city or could we look into a new building, um, state-of-the-art career center, try to get rid of the stigma that's still attached to technical and career education and centrally locate it so that it, now that if we're not with Barry, for example, and we're not in their district anymore, we may be able to move to another place without it feeling awkward. So perhaps there's a place in Berlin or Montpelier that would be a good site for a new center. And that, that would be part of our next step for there. Um, should the governance happen. Either way, we're still looking at what do we need to do to support the students of Central Vermont. Um, so we are working with, um, we've sent out an RFP for marketing firms to meet with us so that we can start getting the word out about all that we're doing and all that we could offer if we had more. And hopefully they will help us to seek the potential funding for a renovation or a new building, whichever we need. So I wanted to update you on both on governance and revisioning. Did I leave anything out, Joe? <laughs> Are there questions? Sorry. No, you're not. I, was, I was wondering what kind of outreach you are doing for voters um, to give out information on your site, or do you have any, um, any other place that, that people can go and look at and get their questions answered? Yeah, we right now we have our website has a lot of the information, and I've been working with the Times Argus to get the word out through them, but I'm looking at what other venues might I share information. And part of this tour of boards this month is to ask for your help in getting the word out and sharing with your constituents that this vote may be coming up. Um, certainly the once we get an approval, if we get that approval from the State Board of Ed, then we're gonna fire up the, the outreach a lot more. But right now it's just a potential. When it becomes more of a reality, then we're gonna be reaching out a lot more and I'll be using Front Porch Forum and some other venues as well. And, and do you have any idea about financial impact, positive and negative, for the, the school districts that are participating? The tuition rate, I don't believe, is going to change a whole lot um, with the governance structure. We're going to, for this first year, we have to have our budget approved by Barry and voted by Barry only. 
regardless of what happens on town meeting day, it's a, it's a Barry budget. Um, and so what I've worked to do is to try to figure out that that bottom line, I need it to work no matter what happens, whether we're in a district or not. The, so the biggest impact is likely to be on Barry because we will then take on some of this, the, um, I would have superintendent duties. The um, human resources might be something that we take on. So the, what we currently pay the Barry Central office will change. We are working on a lease for the space that we currently reside in. And that right now is a three-year lease, the draft. And then beyond that, that's when we would start wondering what the changes might be. Other changes that could happen, um, we're investigating some new programs for potential next year and extending. So um, the Granite Museum, for example, has interest in building a stone arts program back which hasn't been in Barry for probably 20 years. So different things like that can impact our funding, um, it, but there's also a lot of grants out there. The tuition is based on a six semester average of your students. So because we have the most amount of students this year than we have more than any of the last 10 years, the tuition is gonna go up a little bit because it's based on that amount. I also know that the legislator, legislature is working on basically doing a funding formula where the, the money just follows the kids and, and we stop asking for tuition. So then it's the number of kids that we take from each school that that's where the impact would be. So if we, if we were far out beyond our five-year plan and actually had a new building with lots more space and we could take the 350 kids, that's when you're going to see the biggest impact here because that money is likely going to follow those kids instead of being here in Montpelier, it would go to the center wherever that is located. But doesn't it already go anyway? We just pay the tuition. It's a budget line item. It yes, but it depends. So the tuition that you get, the money you get for those kids from the state and from your taxes may not be the same as what our tuition costs. Mm. So you might, there might be a savings. Whereas if the legislature changed that, we would just get that directly from the state. And we would be dropping, like we wouldn't be able to count that child as a one in our per pupil right. mm -hmm. calculations. I see. We're hoping that the benefits are that we fill those positions and jobs that we're all seeking mm -hmm. with students who graduate from our program. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so you, I know a lot of schools have one or no electrician, for example. And so getting electricians out in, into the trades around us carpenters, the plumbers, the, all of those things. So hopefully there are other benefits to the community, nurses. Is there another model like this? Like, it sounds like a very unique structure in terms of calling it like a school district. And then we're not sure what town it will be in. It wouldn't be like a student, if you, if you base it in Berlin, let's say it's not, or if it stays in Barrie, it wouldn't be like, the city of Barrie pays taxes, it would be all the sending towns pay taxes. Right, but all the sending school. towns pay tuition now. Right. All the sending towns would, would support the budget that ultimately goes onto your lines. So, so there are there... two examples existing yeah. currently, but okay. they've been in, three. I think there's three. Okay. And, and, but there hasn't been one created for multiple since. years since 2004 maybe mm -hmm. so there so we actually on the committee we had um jody's counterpart in the springfield area um technical center so he was great at sort of helping us talk through the logistics so it this this model does exist in vermont and it's allowed under state law and there's sounds like three other ones in vermont all but technical schools yeah yes okay yeah there just hasn't been one created in a long time so it's not in our recent memory Andrew? How do students get to the school now and how would they get there in the future? Good question. So the sending schools provide that transportation and it's part of the legal requirements under the law and that would remain the same. Yeah. So should we create a new center, Barry would now need to transport their kids there. And just so I'm clear on how the governance structure would work, the 
So the budget be like a uh, two questions. One, would the budget be a line item on each of the sending schools towns, and then you just add up the total from those eighteen towns, and would the board be elected in a similar manner? I think the budget one is really hard, depending on what formula what formula we end up using. But I believe to start, it would be a line item, similar, just the same as it is now. Okay. It wouldn't change from that unless the legislature makes that change. And then I'm not sure. I don't think I have the answer for you. Yeah. And then what was the other question? How did the board get elected? Ah, so um, the board would come appointed members from each of these. So you would appoint Jill's coming. So the Sunday times would... <laughs> I'm just taking Jill. You would appoint Jill and she would be the member of our board. Oh, yeah. um, and the other four that are not on the sending school boards would be elected on town meeting day. Okay. So they're gonna be elected if we move forward with this governance vote, regardless of whether they get a seat or not. Because there might not be a district to have a seat in. So Jim, it. maybe to elaborate a little bit, my understanding is that it, it's a separate, it's a line item. So theoretically, I think it can happen even under the current structure where the Bear Unified Union School District budget might not pass, but the tech center budget would, for example. Yeah. Um, and so that's, we spend a lot of time at these meetings going through the bylaws and sort of the commingling of votes and the, you know, up or down by town or by total number of votes. I mean, those are the things that are getting like worked out because there's different ways to approach that. Um, I hope obviously being that everyone will be a yes, but. I have a, a question around thinking of disparities for the future. So if, for example, transportation right now needs to be given by a district, you become your independent district. You're saying that, that that will still be charged to the districts that, basically what's happening is you become your own district. My kid says, I wanna go to the tech center uh, in five years and then you this you know you have the open application and then i'm a single mom i have no transportation does this district have to provide it yes so it, and that's the same as what happens right now so right now every sending school except barry because we're attached sends a bus to our programs kids get off they attend the programs and then they the bus comes back and they get on the bus and they go back to they come back here to Montpelier. Um, they go back to all the other schools. Right now we're in 8.30 a.m., 8.20 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. program. Then we have lunch offered to them at Spalding. And at one o'clock they get back on the bus and they come to their sending school and have an academic course or two, depending on the schedule that the sending school has. I see. Yeah. And so that, that will obviously change and they will be there all day. I am hopeful that will change. That's not part of the governance work and it's not it's not necessarily tied with that. I'm hopeful that'll change anyways, that we can provide all of that programming. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering all those possible scenarios, how they will be written in the plan so that works out. I mean, like, I just like to think that becoming independent and then it could be cost prohibited for some of the schools maybe, like if you have to put the money in the budget, number one. Number two, just thinking about these parties and just gonna make status for families that are able to maybe do transportation or not. Um, and how all of that will be included in the plan to, for districts to be able to make that decision soundly, right? Yeah, I invite you to check out the CBCC website and look at the governance information because all the the notes are there in the packets from our meetings. And so you can you can actually read through the bylaws that we've created in the articles. But the transportation one is in there as each sending school will send transportation so that that is taken care of. So a family, if you can get, if your kid can get to their sending school, they can get to this, the career center. I have a question. Oh, sorry, okay. go ahead, Kristen. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I wondered what, thank you, um, Jody and Jill. I wondered what current enrollment looks like from MRPS from both um, uh, Montpelier and Roxbury in CCB, CCCB programs currently. That's a good question. And I can 
get my cell phone and pull it up, but I'm thinking it's like 47 students. Okay. Um, um, and I also, oh, go ahead. There's 70 something from Spalding right now, 50 exactly from U32. And I think it's like 47, somewhere between 43 and 47 per month per year. Okay, thanks. And I'm curious what outreach looks like to our students um, in terms of like center reps coming to um, MHS to recruit students and to what extent, um, you know, staff at MHS helps to place students, you know, once they get a sense of them and their interests and how they, you know, kind of refer or recommend students to go to the center. Good question. So I can only speak from my experience at U32 on this one. But what I know happened there while I was there was that um, the, the Career Center would visit when it was appropriate and we didn't have COVID. And they had a presentation that students could opt into. So there um, in advisory, they were told about the opportunity to go. They could sign up, then they could go to the auditorium and watch the presentation, meet some of the teachers, meet some students that were part of those programs. And then they would follow up with their counselors for that information about how to apply and what to do next. The applications are now online. I think the presentations over the last two years were probably virtual as well. And that we're not sure yet what that's gonna look like. We also have a person who's working on, um, she's our internet and technology person and she's working on outreach to middle schools to try to get the information out sooner about what options there are. Yeah, Crispin, that's pretty similar to MHS, what Jody just described for U32, and it works through our Flexible Pathways program. So Matt McLean is, is highly involved with um, conversations with kiddos about opportunities at the Tech Center as our as are our guidance counselors. Yep. Okay, great. Um, Jody, do you know what the timing uh, is looking like in terms of getting approved by AOE so that you can start moving ahead? And I'm curious how, what's the best way for us to kind of stay informed about, um, you know, any decisions that get made? Um, one thing is that also is coming to mind is that, you know, we'll be, we're two towns in the same district, right? So we'll have constituents from both towns voting. So I'm thinking about what, you know, we can do to get out to our constituents to send kind of a unified message about, you know, why this shift is really beneficial. And so down the line, if you get to that point, I'll definitely be interested to hear um, about that. And if you want to speak to just how, you know, any, um, just how these, um, this is obviously a big move for you all. Um, and just, you know, how these changes or what changes to like to function and programming um, is going to result from from this shift that could get students and families excited and, and voting and voters excited. I think the first big excitement piece is the fact that people will will really have a voice across all sending schools instead of feeling like they had a small contribution in the advisory board that that recommends a budget to the Berry board. They'll actually have a voice in that budget. Um, and that's that's missing now. It really is. Um, things to watch out for October 19th is our next governance meeting. I anticipate that we'll be we will finalize the articles and bylaw. Hopefully we'll have a finalized lease agreement. And if that's true, it'll go from there straight to the state board and the AOE. Uh, Mike, our consultant, has said it's going to take about a month for them to review it and get back to us. So I anticipate that by the beginning of December, we should know if we're moving forward or not. Okay, Did great. I answer and all your questions? I think so, yeah. And by the lease, do you mean uh, a lease agreement for the building with Barry Unified? Correct. A lease for yeah, our okay. current space. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so what else, and if you want to direct me to a resource for this, that's, that's totally cool as well. What else will the sending schools be responsible for under this model? I, the sending schools are responsible for the things that we've already mentioned, so tuition, busing. They are responsible for appointing a board member. I believe that's it. I'm wondering about an IEP. I feel like I remember us talking oh, about the, yeah. the LEA that the sending school would still be responsible for Correct. meeting the student's IEP. So the students still have their case manor, manager at their school. We have a, a director or coordinator um, who coordinates with them mm -hmm. to make sure that the plans are followed while in our building. 
So there's still a case manager assigned. So based, based on what I'm hearing, just so I'm clear, because there there are like there are budget impacts and also mm -hmm. our our number of pupils under this model, if we have those 47 students at in Montpelier schools, they're now not going to be in our schools for the purpose of like equalized pupils. They aren't so, now. What? They're not in your school now. Oh, they're not there now. So that's not a change. Right. They're they're in the tech center. Correct. Okay, that's what I wasn't clear on. You don't count them as a pupil here. No. So even no. if they're coming back for part of the day, even though they're coming classes. back for part of the day, they're my students. Huh. Yeah. So the, you're not going to see a big change in that unless we are able to open a new facility that's larger and accept more students, or open a new program and accept a few more students. Then you'll see that whatever the number shift. And again, it's a six semester average, so it slowly increases. It's not going to jump up or down quickly. So when you say the students there now, they don't count as part of our equalized people count. Right. And right now, they're, I don't know what we, what, what does, what does it cost to send a student to? BTC? That's a really good question. Okay. I will so send that can, to you. We can talk. Yeah. It's unfortunate because that does create a disincentive. I'm not sure if that's anecdotal or if it's actually borne out, but it is a disincentive for schools to send their kids to the technical centers because they don't get to count them as a school student. Yeah. But that, that won't change. That's yeah. how it is right now. Right. The only thing that would change is in the future if it's a larger technical center. And and but it does sound like the way that the money would be sent changes and there would be more money sent to the tech to the tech center under this model, correct? Eventually. Yeah, okay. I think initially there's not gonna be that much of a change because we're, we're still in the same constraints that we have this year. So you mentioned academic um, classes. So if, we, if um, the sending schools pay a tuition, will you be discounting that tuition to send kids back to, for academic classes or how does that work? That's a really good question because, because I don't quite understand the formula yet. I'm still learning a lot. But my understanding is that we, we have a tuition that's set for our students that attend our school. And that doesn't change because we've sent them back at the end of the day for a class. My hope would be that we would be able to keep them for the full day. I don't believe I can change the tuition based on if there's a funding formula from the state. So my hope is that I can find a way to work within that to keep them for the full day eventually. But that's a separate piece from governance. It's not part of those bylaws or articles. But then what it is, so one question around the IEP. So mm -hmm. if a student has an IEP or a 504 plan, then they are sent to you. The district still has a responsibility for that special ed for that student, even though basically the money that the student is all given to the tech center now. The district is still the LEA for the students. Yes, and that's true when you exchange students as well, or if you send them off to, like say you pay for Stone Path or another alternative program. And the district still gets the IEP money, the individual education plan money is special education funding. So it's a different funding structure. It doesn't travel to the tech center. The tech center right. doesn't get that additional money for that um, special education provision. So the LEA receives the funding for that student's IEP and provides the IEP. That's very confusing. Okay. I have a follow-up question on that. How how does it work right now without going into any, if you're able to give us like a high level overview, how does it work now with a student who's on an IEP who's going to um, who's going to the tech center? How how are we providing for that? Or if that's too big of a question, or I don't know if you can answer that. She frozen. No, she's moving. Oh, it was, I'm sorry, did you send that to me? 
Yeah. yeah. I missed the first part. I'm sorry. I missed the, 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 I missed the, the Libby the, part. The, 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 gen, the general question is. Yeah, I got the okay. I got the general question. It works. Jody is, is right on with what she said earlier. It's it's the same thing as we do with exchanges because the money stays with the district for an IEP. We're still the LEA, which makes sense because you know, if Jody were making ID, IEP decisions, Jody and her team were making IEP decisions and we had to pay for them, what if we disagreed about the decision? So mm -hmm. both districts become part of the IEP team as with the family, of course, and when kids are old enough with the kids as well. Um, and decisions are made as a team, right? So we're all at the table together to decide what, what happens. Um, and what are the needs for the, the IEP, but Jody's team would be responsible for carrying it out, any differentiation or any modifications that needed to happen. Um, and we would be in agreement that the services are, are the correct services for the kid. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and do you envision any changes in that relationship partnership as a no. part of this proposal? No, because it's the way IDEA is written uh, that that IEP decisions have to be made by the team that surrounds the kid. And so regardless of what uh, school the kid is at, right, the kiddo's at, we, we make those decisions together. Thank you, that's helpful. Did you see any financial implications for us? Can you say that again, Amanda? I'm sorry, I missed you, the first part. Do you see any, uh, any financial implications for us that you see us? Like, that for the different- Or for any the drafts? For the different governance structures? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, not yet. I think the, the bigger question that the board will have to, I think the governance structure change makes sense, quite honestly. I think the, the bigger question that the board will have to grapple with with the community is a potential change or renovation in the building, which, is a, which will be a significant financial cost. So that, that's the bigger question, the bigger financial burden. Um, I've been to the tech center. I can say they're doing marvelous things with kids. Um, and our kids who go there are have nothing but praise for the staff at the tech center. Um, and I think that the the facility needs an upgrade, right? So, but that's that is a heavy duty money cost as well. So I think that's the larger financial question that the board will have to grapple with at a later time. And I think that's really important to note because if we don't make a shift in governance, then Barry has that decision to make. And it's and all of the sending schools have to pay for it. But if we do shift the governance and we're talking about a, a new space or a renovation, every town has a say in that. And if the board doesn't want it, then that doesn't happen. I think there's more latitude too and where you could go. I mean correct. It seems like you could go anywhere in this governance structure, at least within the 18 town structure rather than being stuck in Barry. Yes, it gives us way more flexibility and, and we can be more centrally located. It's the southernmost town. And so some schools are getting there later than others because it's so much further to have to send their kids. So uh, during the process, I'm sure you kind of developed a list of pros and cons or discussed all the pros and cons. I'm just wondering if that document is available on your website. like. Uh, sort of a list of considered pros and cons. There's a couple of ways the, the information is presented and what I brought tonight for myself is, is probably the best place to look for that. It's the, sort of the three main decision points we made at each meeting. Yeah. And that's right on, on the, um, the, CT, the cvtcc.org webpage. Cause that's kind of what we went through. Cause we did, we, we literally are going through all the articles and talking through those different pieces. And then we make a point of summarizing them in the three or four main points and posting it on that webpage. So you can look at each meeting's main decision points. Um, I mean, so there's, it would be going through um, a meeting minutes. It's and actually it was, even more sort of um, narrative than that. It's more concise, like three main points from each meeting. Okay. You could go through the minutes, but this is just like the talking points. So is that one document like list the meeting date, the three main points? Okay. Yeah. Um, yep. And that's available on the homepage? Like it's a click. Yeah, if you go to cvtcc.org, there's and a There's a button. resources and there's governance, or if you scroll down, there's governance. There's two ways to reach it and then click on that. And then you can open up any of the documents that we have. I mean, I just want to say it's a really fantastic and interesting group of folks from all the different boards. And I definitely, they're, they're 
it would be kind of neat to go back through the minutes because there's definitely pros and cons or different um, considerations depending on the size of your town and how many kids might go and right. what this might mean or not mean. Um, and I'm I'm really honored and excited to have been a part of it. I I definitely didn't have any preconceived notions, but um, it's clear that there is a huge demand for this resource for our kids. And right now we really don't, we as Montpelier Roxbury, for example, along with the other 18 towns, don't have that direct say. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly, you know, over hundred kids weren't able to participate who wanted to. And meanwhile, the demand in the, in the market and in careers, and we want kids to stay and thrive and succeed um, is clearly there. Um, I really like the idea of our boards having more ownership over the decision making. Um, I think the transition probably feels a little scary. So I know we went to the date of 2022, which is coming right up. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not an all or nothing. Like I think if in the next, as Jody pointed out, the next couple months are really sort of where time will tell. So depending on how long the state board and the agency of ed take to consider this, then we'll do a full court press of information. And there are there's sort of ripple effects of the longer that decision is put off, but I'm hopeful if it doesn't happen for 2022, it certainly would happen for 2023. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually are working pretty well in earnest and, and I think we're in pretty good shape right now. Um, so I just, I, I definitely would like to be providing more regular updates to you folks. Um, it is a major time commitment. I spend as much time at these meetings as I do at <laughs> these meetings. <laughs> and, um, and I'm just really excited about the possibilities for our students. And, really grateful for all the work that you guys have all done. It's a lot, but it's really exciting. The possibilities are really exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Hugely appreciate the update and look forward to seeing the process move forward. It's been super informative and thanks for, thanks both of you for all your hard work, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. Thank you. And I just sent you know, that one page that she just told us. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, you've got a good executive assistant over here. It's... Um, great. So uh, let's move on to the two added items. Uh, one committee appointments. Uh, so, Rhett, I will let you confirm this, but my understanding is that. Uh, at least until we reorganize in March, you um, just want to swap out seats where Jerry used to sit, which is the Superintendent Evaluation, Finance, and Negotiations Committee. Um, negotiations is on the quiet side between now and then. So um, my guess is that sounds doable. Does that still make sense? Yeah, it does. I just don't know enough to make a more knowledgeable selection i'll learn no matter where i am and if that's where the spaces are I'd, i'm happy to do that that's where we like you at Rhett. when you don't when you don't know enough to say no so go for it <laughs> uh excellent yeah. Right, I, I would like to invite you though to come to the equity and policy committee and we can like give you an update of what we do. I think like that would be important to kind of just know what each of the committee does and get familiar through this process. Yeah. Um, I think next week it wouldn't hurt when we talk like finance committee and policy committee to kind of provide that overview as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that will work too. I just wanna, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, and stopping it at the meeting. <coughs> It works too, but we will we get we'll, we will put committee updates on more regularly. So um, I, I'd be happy to 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 pop in. I, I would like to sit in on the meet the committees that I'm going to be on first and get an idea of how that goes, and then schedule time to uh, like sort of uh, you know sit in on other committee meetings to get an idea of where everybody is. And, you know, if there is sort of a realignment, you know, I, I, I want to be as knowledgeable as I can and, and fit all these pieces together as best as we all can. Thank you. Once upon a time, I think, once upon a time, I think Emma suggested that we 
post kind of like, you know, the like the function of the committees and give a description. Um, I wonder if that's something that each committee could do and whether it's posted online, you know, next to our committees, both for the purpose of the public knowing what we do. And then also, you know, as new board members come in, it's a spot where they can just, um, you know, get us a good sense of what committees functions are. I think it would be great if we had a board member do that considering how short staff Administration. That's what I, yeah. yeah, that's, that's what I'm suggesting is that if each committee could even work together to, you know, hammer out some language. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, why don't, yeah, why don't boards just do that, like a couple lines to put, because we have, we have all the committees listed, but we do not have a description. I mean, other than the other than the names, which are somewhat descriptive, but don't fully cover it. Yeah, we should do all do that. Yes. I think eventually it will be really great if we could start compiling this in documents. So we have like a, our own full board member welcoming packet. We're like, it's actually our, our welcoming packet. This is who we are. This is what we do. Here are the committees. Here are the ways that you can plug in. Here are the ways that you we make decisions. Like eventually, so like this could be the beginning of that little packet. So that when new board members come in, we give them here how we function um, rather than. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Really good idea. Part of our improvement plan for uh, onboarding new members. Yes. <laughs> We've discussed other improvements as well. Yeah. Yes, no, definitely. I mean, on that note, I'm wondering, Rhett, is there anything that you feel like you need right now from any of us that we can oh. follow up with you after this meeting? Um. I just need everybody to be honest when I'm doing something wrong. That's all I need. I I I don't um I don't know what to ask for. I just don't know. Um but um you know I, I want to know when, you know, what what questions are appropriate when and to you know get suggestions or even a thumbs up here or there. I don't know. We'll go a long way. Consider me to be like a six-year-old at this point. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, definitely feel free to ask ask questions of any of us. And um, I believe, thanks, Jill, for reaching out and, yeah. and mentoring. I know you guys have been in touch and, yeah. and we've talked, but I think anyone would be welcome to you know spend half an hour, an hour with you, either on the phone or Zoom or meeting downtown to, to talk things through. Um, yeah, I was, um, I was considering potentially trying to appear in some of these public facing efforts, maybe with some of the Montpelier board members. I don't know how that works. If there's any that only one person is attending, because I think if there are three, then that changes the dynamic as I understand it. So I don't know if that's a possibility or not. And I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely getting a lot of support from Kristen. Um, and we're, you know, we've had some, some, we've made some effort to connect with some people in Roxbury. And I think we've had some success. I think that it'll, you know, that'll, that effort will grow. But what has come out of that is just talking about the board and talking about kind of how things work. And Kristen's been, a, 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 you know, Jill has offered to be a mentor. I also consider Kristen to be a mentor as well, in a sense, just how do we represent Roxbury? What, how do we do that in a way that, that works for everyone and the, the sort of different perspectives that are coming out of Roxbury? The caveat, Rhett, is that I am not seasoned, but I'm trying, I'm trying to be accurate and correct, but um, yeah, well, I think we could all use some support. Yeah, and, and, and we have a very, um, very new board kind of across, across the spectrum. Um, so we need nominations for 
to a point and uh, rent to uh, these three committees, superintendent evaluation, finance, negotiation. I think we can do it probably all as one motion. Um, do I have a motion for that appointment? So moved. Uh, do I have a second? I second. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Brett, you can appoint yourself. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I to add something right yeah. before we move on. Brett, just so you know, I, I think you got an email about this today. We're going to have a finance committee meeting before our next board meeting. So they have a superintendent evaluation committee. There's no meeting yet. No meeting yet. Well, yeah. We're, we're talking right. about it, right? Balls in my court to okay. write up notes and stuff from our last meeting yeah. to share with the the whole board actually excellent and and Brett, just so you know you'll get an advance of that meeting and everybody on the board gets this it you'll get a quarterly report that is quite detailed about where we're spending from where we're getting money from various fund balances um long-term debt and our progress paying that off that type of information so you'll want to read that in advance of that finance committee meeting because we generally go over that together and ask questions. Excellent. Well, I would I'd also suggest getting in touch with the chairs of all three committees and they're listed on the, the website. But um, Mia. I'll email you, right? Andrew for finance. We don't actually have a chair on the finance okay. committee, but you can you can feel free to email me, Rhett. Well, and just do a twofer with Andrew and talk to him yeah. about negotiations too. Or yeah, yeah. I think would be willing to talk about that. Sure. And, yeah. Emma is the policy. Oh, Emma is the new policy the chair. Unofficial, okay. The unofficial, but very official. Yeah. yeah. But she's not on the policy. Yeah. So <laughs> a phone um, call. A phone call would be great if that's if that's a reasonable thing with I'll just, you know, I guess. Andrew for finance, Emma for policy. I don't know, um, Mia and Amanda either. Yeah. Or, I mean, Kristen, I, I, but I would like to talk to each of you if I can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's have Thank coffee. You. That's, that's, okay. what I, that's what I did when I first joined the board, Rat, and I found it to be really helpful. Great. All right. I mean, I'm, I'm close by, so coffee is good and lunches, whatever. I can, I can, I can arrange things a lot of the time. Um, for the next few weeks, I'm going to be uh, kind of attached to my house in some ways. So that might make it a little tricky, but we'll see. Okay. We'll figure it out. Excellent. Um, next thing is removing Andrew from the policy committee. I don't, I think we need an action for it to reduce. I think Andrew can step off if he wants to, but um, just removing or moving the number from four to three and removing Andrew, we should have board action for that. Um, I move to relieve Andrew of his duties on the policy committee. <laughs> and reduce the number. And reduce members. the number of board members of the policy committee from four to three. Do you have a second? I second that. Any discussion? I feel relieved. Yeah. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. We all feel relieved. Yeah. So I have another reluctant point of business is the, um, when we're talking about appointments because I have slid under the radar since getting off of the school safety case relations committee with only one committee assignment. Yeah. So are you required to or is it just me? There's, there's not any required yeah. number. I've, I've had three for yeah, I know. Mom and said that it's red has not, three. Yeah, very so sustainable. I would really like to serve on the facilities committee, and I don't know if that's if there's somebody that is currently serving on three committees or doing a lot that might want to step down, and I'll replace them. Can I interject? I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I mean, we should think about like, do we need to be in multiple committees, or can we just do a lot of work in the committees that we're in? Because there's a lot of work that needs to happen in the policy committee. Yeah, I would love for you to just like do more there because we all need that. Anyways. Right. And instead of adding more to your plate, it's like I have this committee and I'm gonna do all the things that we need to yeah. do. So I'm just being yeah. a, a voice of caution. If already the other committees are fine, but if you really want to serve, that's great. But 
there's a lot of work that needs to get done. Yeah, I would second that. That's a busy committee, and if, and as chair, I I I'm okay. We can reassess maybe in a few months, but okay. Unless how there's... often does the facilities committee? It's only quarterly, and Emma has been expressed interest. I I mean, Emma, if you want to join that committee, sure. my general thought is. It's it's a we meet on generally a quarterly basis. I mean, quarterly maybe. sounds relaxed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we might it yeah. might be a, we've we've met a, I feel like we've met like in between a quarterly meeting so far. I mean it was just formed. Right. Um so I'd say we had two meetings in the past quarter, but when is the next meeting? I don't know. It's a good definitely. question. Like which, when when was the last meeting? The last meeting was when August? Yeah. Or early September. Okay. I think it was August before the school year started. And the end of August, yeah. Yeah, it was right before um, Andrew did the big presentation. Andrew LaRosa. Andrew LaRosa did that. Yes, yeah, that's sorry. right. To be more specific. That's right. Yeah, we met with. <laughs> it was like the day before the board meeting. Met. So it doesn't sound like there's any rush and an immediate need, but I am interested. And I think quarterly is completely manageable. And I can still step up to the plate to help policy. All right. It is because right. and I and I I'm wondering. My question is basically: Is there somebody on the facilities committee that's feeling strapped for time? Why? Well, well, it's only a three-member committee. If you just if we, we yeah. can just add you. Yeah. yeah. That might be good as a member of the facilities committee, even though it has been very low demand because I am feeling very cold in the. I was. CDs. I had Jill in mind. Yeah. See, yeah. see in my um, and that is. That has been a very huge lift and it's not ending anytime soon. Right. Do you want to swap? No, she wouldn't be swapping. She'd be stepping down. Well, that's what I mean. And I would so, be willing to swap. I thought we were just adding you and I could be less. That's I think that, that's fine. I do still want to be on it. Okay. Well, that's, that's, yeah. that's just add Emma. Add okay. Emma. Yeah. Oh, sounds good. Okay. I just realized I was on four committees until just a minute ago, yeah. which <laughs> is why I definitely felt stressed. Yes. <laughs> um, do you have a motion to add? Emma to the facilities committee and make it a four member committee. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Emma. Aye. Awesome. Right. Any opposed? Great. All right. Um, policy monitoring. We have two policies up for monitoring. May, may uh, I ask a question? Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, if there are, are there clearly committees that are just more? work than others and has it ever been discovered to have a or discussed to have a rotation if there's if there's if if there's a, if there's a committee that's like pretty clearly a lot of work has it ever been discussed that there be a a a sort of predictable ro rotation on it i could add just in my time it's more that the committee work themselves can be cyclical i i can't speak for all the committees right. but for example negotiations was like very labor intensive not to play a pun, for a, a window of time. It was a lot of evening lunchtime meetings. A lot of time was spent in the Labor Relations Committee. And now it's it's not. So that I think that's true for some of them, right? And that's why I sort of thought it'd be good to have Emma on facilities because if something does start to ramp up to have another body on it. I do think the policy committee and the equity committee, I mean, there's other committees that are newer and seem to be active. very active. Um, ongoing so it depends on the committee but a lot of them are cyclical yeah. I don't know. like superintendent um evaluation committee i feel like is a quite a bit of work for like one three month period yeah that's very cyclical and and as far as um the rotation goes red every march after town meeting day we revisit committees so that's a i mean obviously as you can see in this board meeting it can happen at any point but that's the moment that we kind of take stock and everybody either says, yeah, I'm good where I am, or um, or no, I think I should shift or step down from something in a pretty holistic way. So it happens once a year. OK, thank you. Before moving on to policy monitoring, we have yes. the community engagement, right? Oh, that's yeah, right. Oh, agenda. sorry. Thanks for reminding me. Yes. yes. Um, the updates. So I don't know if uh, can we have, do we, do you have that? Can you put it on the Zoom? Does everybody have it? Uh, have it? I don't know who's up, to, who's up to the Zoom and can do a screen share. Um, I can share with you. What do you need screen? What do you need shared? The community engagement document, maybe? 
I'll email it to you quickly, Libby, so okay. you have it. I can see. In my phone. But I just had a, I had a couple of questions. I can't see. <laughs> um, regarding updates, I know that Kristen, you had some updates. Um, Annie said we were supposed to do the, the race against racism, but it got canceled. I reached out to the farmers market. They said anytime. You just we just have to let them know we're coming because there's a lot of space. And so you signed up, yep. whoever signed up. So then we just need to tell them when. Emma already uh, did a, a it's schedule. Scheduled. Yep. And, uh, well, you can talk for yourself. I scheduled a listening session with the uh, Main Street Middle School Caregivers Alliance or Community Alliance. Um, and that's scheduled for October 12th from 7 to 8 p.m. And they're doing the outreach for that. I did email all board members to invite you if you want to join. Um, Jill, I think you're the only other board member that has a student at Main Street Middle School right now. So I don't know if you have time availability that night. Feel free. Um, if we end up having a quorum, we'll just be very clear to not interact very much. And sort of the model is to just receive feedback anyway. Um, however, however, if you're going to have a quorum, you do need to warn it. Mm. So I thought that if it was a listening session, all, the whole board could be there just to listen for something, right? I thought that was discussed at the last meeting. Yes. That, that, it is? Yeah. Okay. Because it's not a meeting, we're not going to be making any decisions. We're just listening to the meeting. Okay. So if people want to join, um, hit me up via email, and I'll send you the link. So um, I think for the so I have three groups. Uh, one is BIPOC group um, that I'm going to do a listening session with, and they're trying to organize the date right now. I have a group with families with kids with IEP that are going to be organizing, telling me the date. And then there's a group that's going to start to meet around literacy stuff that I'm going to ask them also to set up a date for us to have a listening session. So those are kind of the focus groups that have been created. But if you have, I think if you, if you have ideas, I mean, I send out the whole packet with the flyers so you can just let us know when. And I think that we have to kind of like move that forward in the next as much as we can. And uh, Kristen, do you have any updates? Oh, there it is. Sure, yeah. Uh, Rhett and I have been a two person street team uh, out here in Roxbury. We uh, did a uh, kind of listening session on the front porch of the Roxbury Country Store last week. Um, Rhett attended a community potluck and was able to. Um, just hear from some folks. And then we also were at uh, Roxbury Village School just this past Monday for three hours, um, catching parents at pickup, uh, both at the end of the school day and from after school pickup and just invited the community at large to come in and see us then. Um, so yeah, we've been hearing a mix of different things, um, a lot of positives and you know, constructive uh, feedback. And yeah, it's just been great to get out and see folks. I think people have been just really delighted to see us and kind of see the effort. And I think our hope is, is that, you know, like we were talking about the last meeting, if it just really comes part of like what we do and, um, you know, show face that folks, you know, should something come up, um, we'll feel, you know, a sense of who we just know who we are and, um, you know, and a sense of trust. And um, yeah, so that's been really great. And then I think we have one more, we're going to be at the Roxbury Free Library on Saturday the 16th. Um, so my question was too, I know this was all kind of at least this initial push was to try to gather information from folks to get to you Libby by the 20th. Was that the date and is that just fine in like an email? I don't know if you want it in any particular way. Uh, Kristen, I did send out a form, like the idea is to yeah. put all of this in one document together. Okay. Um, that I Sorry. plan to put in as themes. Um, okay, great. So I did create a form that has like all the questions and like if you wanted to add anything else in there, that would okay. be helpful to have that filled yeah. out. Yeah. 
happy to do that. Um, so first of all, I missed the, the meeting last time, but first of all, I just want to say thank you so much, Amanda. This looks awesome. Yeah. It's really well organized and the form is a great idea. It's a great way to pull all this information together. Uh, I love the look of the flyers as well. Um, in terms of some of these different listening sessions, all of them are, are full already. If I see some that I want to jump in on. Should I just email board members directly? Yes. All right. Great. I also have a meeting with Matt McLean next week to discuss um, ways to get student involvement, both input on the budget cycle and also potential of recruiting one or two student board members. So I have a, that meeting is on the calendar for next week. Awesome. I, and can you ask them, or can you ask them about the student groups? Because I know that last year when I was doing the community advising for RJA, we wanted Jim to come and explain the whole budget process, but that we, just, we didn't schedule it so yeah, and then COVID happened. But so that that could be something like they just want to know the budget yeah, like process. Yeah, like attending a regular meeting of the student, various student groups. And then I had a question about money, like the budget. Like, so I wanted to make some of these uh, flyers multilingual for some of the families. Um, and I want to be able to, and I wa wanted to ask permission to speak with the ELL department to see if they could help me organize a, um, a meeting with the multilingual families and for us to pay for the translation if needed, so I can set up the Zoom with the multiple uh, languages and then have the session. So I wanted to ask if we have money for translation, which I know, and then if we had money to get some of the flyers so I can post them around town in the co-op and library and all of that. Um, so that's what I had. I can print them at Capital Coffee. Do we need to vote on that if we're taking that out of the fund balance to provide well, the budget money? What's that? The, the, the board has its own line in the budget. Yeah. I, so is that something we need to vote on? Do we need like a, a, or do we need an amount? I think it depends on the amount. Um, Amanda, you, the budget would the money would be spent on. Translation services and printing. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? So I want to. Do you have an so estimate? The, so the translation services for. So right now, because I just did that with the Ulias Caregivers Alliance. So I know that for the elementary school, uh, we have three languages that are requested to be translated. There's seven or eight families that are not requested, but that you might need it. So like, uh, I just translated these little flyers for the meeting that we had. Um, and I use this service, but the, the ones that we use for translation are like $45 an hour for two languages. And these are local folks. Um, but the translation of documents versus the the interpretation at a meeting is different rates. Yeah. So I so first I need permission to talk to the ELL department to just to come up with like, okay, what are the languages? How much so we're gonna get and to see if we can get up a date so that they can request the languages so that I know to find the translators and to make sure that we can pay them. That's one. And so that's one thing. And the other money, it's like, you know, I don't know, 40 bucks for printing a couple yeah. of copy, yeah. color copy, so that our pictures can be seen. <laughs> no, but um Amanda, but, we can do printing, we can do color copies in our in our office. Okay. Not a problem. Okay. Pay for that. So I can I can send you those. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Just tell me how many you need. And then uh if you just write down the questions you have for the EL team, I can get those answered for you. Okay, I so I wanted to work with them to come up with a focus group. 
You're, are you asking for their help in recruiting the families to because yeah they have the channels so i can ask I can them what you think the best way to do that is not yeah i can ask them what the best way they think they to do that is if you just write down some of those questions for me and send in an email i'd be happy to to get that to them and they can they can give us some feedback on it okay great and then it sounds like the the question is just probably it's it's one it's translation of the flyers which sounds like it if it's a flyer it's not going to take them an hour to do so we're probably talking about a hundred bucks at the most depending on the number of so languages. i use i i use and not i use just like this the fiverr which is like this website that has independent contractors all over the world for the u.s caregiver alliance and it was like five bucks for one little paragraph for language, so it like it cost me like fifty bucks. But I'm not sure if it's district money. If you have any, uh, if you are able to use, like we cannot use it as a state, for example. So I don't know if you have any things that you cannot oh, use. requirements. Yeah, because these are people from the from the countries that they, you know, like so. Um, so it's international, but it's a US-based website. You know what I'm saying? It's a network of independent contractors from all over the world that are in this website that is, but it's paid through the US. So the question would be, can you use school district dollars to pay this website service? Exactly. Or is there some sort of restriction on Or if not, dollars? then the budget changes Wait, because then it's 45. The website or the payment going to the contractor directly from? The website. The website. Yeah. That's as long as we're not using grant money, it, that's not a problem. Okay. So should we vote to like approve up to two hundred dollars, and then we'll see how it goes? Is do you need to vote for two hundred dollars? I don't think we need to vote for two hundred dollars, do we? And yeah. maybe can I get reimbursed, or do I go through? Do I do give you the whole thing? You give us the, the easiest way to go about doing it and the cleanest with the auditors is for us to contract directly with them. So we would, we would do that work for you. Okay. If you could just okay. get it to us, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we spent this amount of money, I think, out of the good grant. Okay. I think that's a great idea, Rhonda, and I appreciate you taking the initiative to set that up. And I think it's something that we could potentially use in the future for other things too. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Great. All right. Right. Thank you. On to policy monitoring. Um, I think the first up is EO3. Budget policy. Is that policy monitoring? Is that well we've got we've got EO1 and EO2 on the first reading. Oh, okay. And EO, oh, see. EO3 see. is the budget policy. Um, do I have a motion to approve the budget policy monitoring report? I move to approve uh, the EO3 budget policy monitoring report. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, second. Uh, policy monitoring report is AO4 superintendent expectations. Do I have a motion to approve AO4 superintendent expectations? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I have a discussion. I have a question. Yes. Um, so maybe this is for Libby, but in so in the section on the interpretation of employment, compensation, and treatment of staff. Um, the bullet point number three, uh, your interpretation is to hire the best possible people for our district. Um, but when reading the policy, bullet point number three is quite lengthy and includes the superintendent will take meaningful steps to promote, to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in the hiring process. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could give us some input. You know, I, I've think I read pretty thoroughly and just wasn't seeing anything on that in particular, what the district has been doing to ensure, um, you know, best practices around recruitment for diversity, equity, inclusion. 
think we're still learning on that. And that's a, that's a hard piece for everybody across Vermont and in school districts, especially I, the agency of education has put together a task force and how to hire more diverse work staff, which I was a part of last year, um, along with floor from U32, the U32 uh, board chair. Uh, so I, I took a part in that um, and provided feedback and done some trainings on it. We're also looking into a variety of different websites, web-based things that will help us um, that are specifically for um, BIPOC individuals to see jobs. So we're, we're posting specifically on those websites now. Wonderful. Um, that's new. That's very new. Um, and we've also hooked up with a service from Keene State. Um, most recently that they, they now have a service and I apologize, actually Heather Michaud is in the room. So she might be able to give us more information than, than I do since this isn't her wheelhouse. Um, but uh, Heather found out through Keene State that they have a service that sends job postings out to colleges and universities across the US to try to, to, try to target more, uh, more people and, and get more interest in coming to Vermont. Heather, do I have that right about Keene State? All over, and you can pick the colleges you want to send your information to. And it's sort of like you have to provide a little bit of information. About yeah, your research. that's great. And get services that approved and post here. So basically, you can just pick every college. Some colleges have responded to say, sorry, you haven't been accepted to post here because we don't have an education degree. So they, they deny you to be the ability to post at that college. So that's really, really great information to have. And I mean, I, this is such an intense policy <laughs> and it's, and like, it just outlines how, um, in depth and extensive your job title is and how much is under your umbrella and seeing the four to five page monitoring report here uh, you know I, I hate to um, ask for more but I just feel like because we have a great diversity equity and inclusion policy um, and that's outlined here I, I almost would like for your monitoring report to be reflective of everything that you you know or at least touch on that piece of it um, before it becomes part of public record, because I think that it would benefit everyone to know what efforts are being made. Sure. I mean, I can, I can tell you, honestly, the, um, I, I'm just purely be honest from this, yeah. probably just over, I just overlooked that piece of the policy without meaning to just in just to get the monitor. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you are so busy that I do not blame you for overlooking a little piece of this. And there's so much, there's so much language in the policy too. Um, there was one other question. It says that the, follow, the hiring process basically will follow a process that allows for substantive input from parents and community members. And I've just noticed when we're um, approving like the hiring recommendations, that typically those spots are left empty. Like where if there was parents on the committee or community members or students. And so it's been sort of a lingering thought in the back of my mind. Like I'm not, I've been on a couple of hiring committees with this district where there weren't any um, students. Usually there's parents, but I'm just not sure if they're, if, if they're not listed because of like privacy reasons or something, or if it's because of COVID that we haven't really been doing that piece. Yeah, we haven't been inviting people in through COVID. Um, okay. And we had a lot of hiring to do this past hiring season. So, uh, and strapped for other reasons. So it, it may have just not happened um, yeah. past season. Uh, students are often on teacher hiring committees, especially at the high school. So um, they may just be left off, just the principals think not to put them on the hiring sheet. Um, because that's a that's a pretty common practice unless we're like moving very quickly, you know, yeah. and, and don't have a lot of time. Um, so, you know, so for instance, our health teacher who we went through the hiring process with, like in the winter last year, there was a middle school student and a high school student on that committee. And I'm not sure if that went through. Um, with parents, it's probably 
COVID related for the past couple of, year, couple of years. But again, it also depends on the timing and how quickly we need to move in the hiring yeah. process. And I'm gonna promote this on the course teacher. Great. Yeah. I mean, so so I don't know what the next step is, If but personally, I would like to see potentially a different interpretation of that bullet point and then some more evidence to speak to those things is what I would be asking for. And I don't know if that means that we need to pull it and vote for it at a different meeting or if other people disagree, that is totally fine. I have one more point because I can't see. <laughs> um, so I had a question regarding the evidence on the, the employment compensation and treatment of staff. And the, here's a, in the first paragraph that the dissent in direction of understanding of the contract has been brought to the attention of the superintendent multiple occasions. It, it just uh, doesn't give me enough information to. And then it says there's no discrimination, kind of like two different things. And I don't know how that paragraph is related to yeah, I just, I don't understand it. So can you ask a specific question? Yeah, so like, what does it mean when it's dissent in direction or, or understanding of contract has been brought to the attention of the superintendent of multiple occasions? Yeah, so I have a, I have a um, monthly union meeting with union leadership from our instructional assistants and our teachers. And when there's problems with contractual problems or climate or culture problems, um, then we have a very open conversation about that and try to problem solve together around what we can do differently and do better. So, and I meet with Carolyn Canari quite honestly, who's the president of the teachers union nearly daily. Um, she's, <laughs> she's always in my office talking with me and we're work, working together. So that's what that means is that we have a very open communication when there's any kind of problems. Our principals also have either bi-monthly or monthly meetings with union leadership as well in the individual schools. Okay. Okay, and then the, the last point is, I know that in the la we had this conversation before. Um, this is the evidence around, sorry, I can't, my eyes don't work. I have a doctor's appointment, so. So I can see with the mask and the phone. Um, the communication and support of the board is that the last paragraph around the superintendent and the board chair have conversations when the board may be out of compliance. I just feel like we've had this conversation and we let it go from the last uh, policy. And I would like to see a little more transparency about how conflict um, gets deal with before it gets into the public record. Um, and, and I think that's a conversation that, you know, I brought up before about, you know, just like, how do we deal with conflict and how do we deal with these disagreements before just like being put into a document like this. So that uh, I feel like we haven't really had a conversation. We kind of left that conflict in there and then moved on. And now it's back in here in this, in this document. Um, so. I, so there's a, a thing about people being in groups, and so I don't really understand what that means. Uh, regarding the proper procedures for email and participation in groups, and just like I just want to have some clarity around that. So as part of this policy, it says it's the superintendent's responsibility to bring um, items that could be per, per the construed as uh, breaking board member protocols. Um, and what we've done in the past, and Jim, you can step in, is that I would bring those to Jim uh, and we discuss it and Jim would decide whether or not to bring that to a larger, to the larger board or to individual board me me members to speak to, being okay. the chair of the board. I just, yeah. What I'm hearing you say, Amanda, and definitely tell me if I'm misinterpreting it, that this is this could be a moment to revisit what we an effort we started underway, I think early summer, 
as a board to figure out how we work through disagreements and conflict. Yeah, we are still in coordination with um, Carol at, about putting together a training on that. She's just been slow. Where's, where's Carol from? Uh, she's at, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so she's putting together, uh, she's putting together a proposal, um, but she's just been slow. So I think it's it's uh, yeah, she wants to give some thought. Yeah, I mean, so, I yeah. will second sort of just the concern about you know when uh, earlier when Rhett said you know I, all I'm asking is if people see that I'm doing something wrong to please be honest with me and come to me and talk to me, and that definitely rings true to me. Um, I know that I did something in an email. I wrote an email that I felt was coming from my position as a parent and as a member of the graduation committee at the Main Street Middle School. And I wrote an email to the principal and that, that action was then brought to my attention many weeks later in a policy monitoring report. And I never heard about it prior to that. So I think that that's just poor communication, it's breakdown in communication. Um, I, I will second the sentiment of Rhett that I just want to hear <laughs> from people. I don't want to be blindsided in a public document that will be part of public record about something that I did that was um, interpreted to be in non-compliance in non of a policy. So I just, um, and I think that the breakdown in communication, to be fair, was that Jim never <laughs> spoke to me about it after Libby spoke to Jim about it. So that's where I've landed is that, you know, it's part of the chair's duty. Libby was following her communication protocols in communicating um, her interpretation of my actions to our board chair. And then the board chair did not communicate that to me. <laughs> so. Before, prior to me reading about it in the policy monitoring report. So, I mean, I think we just need to um, look inward and improve our practices, you know, as a board. And I think definitely <laughs> meeting with um, somebody from the Community Justice Center around um, conflict resolution would be a great first step. Yeah, no, and I totally own that mistake. And that was, um, was a miscommunication failure on my part. Um, and, and this does not, this sentence does not say the same thing that was in the other policy monitoring report. So now we're talking about participation in groups on social media, which is not anything that I have heard of. And it may not be about me <laughs> or my actions this time. But yeah. um, I mean, I mean that, that is the point is like what I see in a, in a policy monitoring report should reflect that, like the bigger picture, right? Like these to me is like li these little things that were conflicts that didn't get aroused. Like we're not writing about conflicts with the union the same way, or we're not writing about conflicts with students the same way. You know, like that's not, that should not be the practice uh, for the policy management reports, unless like there was something like really big deal. Like these are like communication issues that are not. So I, I mean, I just want to throw that out there. I know that we have a process coming from, you know, with the proposal with the Community Justice Center about like how we can be together. So I just want to flag it and put it out there. And, you know, like I don't, you know, want to steer more things about it, but I wanted to be honest about the way that I felt about that and how it was inconclusive that the conversation that we need to continue. Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like I need to just balance out that I also don't think the superintendent expectations fully capture the huge responsibility that Libby and our administration has had to take on during the current crisis, which is now in its third school year. And that the above and beyond and being sort of the voice of calm and, um, and rational thought in dealing with this ongoing and changing pandemic um, even when it's lacking other places has been very much appreciated. And I, I can't imagine that everything you do is ever captured in an expectation for a position like yours. I don't know when you sleep or eat, but um, I just feel really compelled to acknowledge as we continue this and it has not gotten any easier as we 
go month by month. That that also is not <laughs> probably in the job description to the level that you have taken on on the state level, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. And, and these policy monitoring reports are something that this is not required by law. This is something that Libby is doing to keep us informed. And honestly, this type of conversation, I feel like, is 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 part of the value of this exercise as well. I have a couple other questions, but the monitoring report. Um, let's, maybe there's... let's do try to stay on track though. I know Libby and Rico have a long day. Yep. So, and we've still got an executive session. The under treatment and communication with parents, one of the interpretations you have is to ensure the culture and climate of the district responds to the concerns brought for, forward to us. Could you just say a little bit more about what you mean by that? I think that um, we're when parents are very angry about something, often it's you're treating you're treating me or you're treating my child in a way that the district doesn't map doesn't value. Um, they may not say it in those words, but often that's that's what we hear, right? Or that's that's how we should be interpreting it. And one piece that I've certainly learned in my four years, going on four years here, um, is to truly. Nobody, nobody in my administration or my staff wants kids to not feel good about themselves when they enter the building. And so when that happens, um, it's our job to apologize, right? Mm -hmm. And to try to figure out how to fix it. And I think that's what I was trying to get at. That's not an incredibly articulate way of saying it, but um, in, in any communication with a parent that we have, particularly from the administrative lens, we wanna really be thinking, beyond what the words might be on the page. What is this parent feeling or what is their child feeling? And how can we make that um, different? How can we make that better? Mm -hmm. uh, we're not always successful, <laughs> but mm -hmm. that, that certainly school should be the most welcoming place for the children in our communities and, and our communication matters with that, right? So mm -hmm. that's what I think I'm trying to get at there. Uh, maybe not the most articulately, but yeah. Thank you. And then just one other question, which is, um, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so thanks for expanding on that. And then one other was, um, I forget which category it went under, but one piece of evidence is that you, that you noted was that you meet with faculty throughout the year. And we hear a lot about you meeting with union reps and et cetera. But what I interpreted that was like, like the, the, the faculty you would, that aren't necessarily you interact with as a, you know, part of the job description, of course, uh, now I'm not being articulate. I guess my question is, what are some examples of outside of, you know, meeting with union reps? What yeah. are some examples of what that looks like when you meet yeah. with faculty throughout the year? So we have actually one gift I was given when I took this job on was that there was already district days built into our calendar, um, like district staff meeting days. They actually used to be when I, when I took over once a month. Um, and, and we didn't continue that practice for many, for a variety of reasons, mainly because we wanted the schoolwork to be so focused and needed more time there. But uh, about four to five times a year, we still have those district days. Uh, we largely focus in on equity work in the last two years around it, but it also, it was a gift for me to be able to be in front of them and they could hear me often, right? <laughs> and more than just emails and and that kind of thing and mm -hmm. hear what I had to say. And, you know, there was one one time mid-year of my first year where I realized that they didn't know, like I never told my story to them. So we took a faculty meeting for me to tell my story of why I am where I am and what I believe in and allowed the entire faculty to ask any question they wanted. You know, so there's, there's uh, times like that. There's also, you know, because of COVID and the response we've done, um, ton of internal community forums where teachers ask me any question regarding what's happening in the COVID, COVID context mainly. Um, and if I don't know the answer, then I get back to them really quick with whatever answer we can find. So there's multiple times and multiple ways in which I do that. I write the faculty a email every week and sometimes it's a real big cheerlead email and sometimes it's a, hey, this week kind of stank the email and sometimes it's 
it's just a meme, you know, like, so, it, so there's multiple ways that I, they reach out to the faculty and, and talk with them um, so that they know that I'm not just a figurehead at the, in the central office, but that, that I'm a person who cares a whole lot about them and, and works with them, you know. Great. Thanks. Um, this is also some questions about this. Do we want to table this and have Libby fill in a couple more answers? That would be what I would ask for, but I mean, it sounded like specifically you were just asking for a little bit more detail around the hiring for diversity, yeah. equity, and inclusion. And Was parent, that the, and, and the parent involvement, parent involvement in hiring? Yeah. yeah, that one bullet point, and just to get provide, I, I think maybe revisit your interpretation of it just for the record and. Um, and then provide more detail in the evidence section about that. We could just go to the meeting minutes. We could watch them. <laughs> I can help. Just, um, yeah, you, I think you said it tonight, and that I just think that should be reflected in the record. But if other people are ready to move it forward as is, then we can discuss that. I mean, I'm okay tabling it. Um, I'm okay either way. Does anybody want to push to a vote? I make a motion to table it. Yeah. Who made the original motion? Yeah, I did. I want to just table your motion. Oh, I think sorry. you can give the power. All right, I'll table your motion then. Okay. Excellent. So it's um, we can include that on next week's agenda. Um, two weeks. Right. Yeah. yeah, the next meeting's agenda is what I'm going to say, um, which is two weeks away. Uh, so we have three, well, we have two second first readings and one first first reading of policy um, readings. The, just for context, the reason that we have a we are re first reading EO1 and EO2 is because um, the, the wrong documents got included in the package last time. So we included the right ones with the proper uh, red line language. Uh, and then the animal dissection policy is, um, is just up for renewal. So it's the same, same policies we it's had. It's the same before. exact language. And the only thing that we discussed at the policy, the main thing that we discussed at the policy committee was to ask for procedure, which we already asked for at the last meeting, ask for procedure to be typed up and, and included on our website next yes. to the policy. So can I, could I make a motion to move all three forward? Yes, please you do. Just move them to second reading. Is that how this works? Yeah. Yes. Oh, cool. does, does, does anybody have a question about any of the policies? Yeah, I was going to do that after we got a motion to. Oh, do, it, what's the order here? Mo motion to approve then? Motion, the discussion. second, discussion, vote. Yeah. Okay, I second the motion. Discussion? Any questions, discussion? Didn't Red have a question about the, the finance uh, uh, fiscal management? There's a line in there. Uh, did you write or I, I know you had some back and forth with grants so and you got your question answered. Yeah, there was a piece about <clears throat> I was curious about the um, the language that there would be two percent. On, let me pull this up. Is this for the EO one, Rep? <clears throat> Maintain a minimum amount of funds in yeah of of two percent. Yeah. Yeah. Where where does that? I guess yeah. I didn't I didn't That's quite understand a, where it goes. So what that means is that. It's what we call fund balance. It's the balance that we keep in the funds. Like say you had, you you calculated your annual um, spending for your household. You'd set what this would be. What would be I'm I'm just giving you an example as it pertains to your household spending and and for members of the public. You'd take two percent of your annual household spending. So say your household spends fifty thousand dollars annually. You would take two percent of that which is $1,000 and make sure that you always had that in a savings account so that if something unexpected came up, you'd have a thousand dollars there to spend on that. That's, that's what this 2% represents for our budget. 
And we've had a bit more than that in recent years, which has been helpful for extraordinary situations related to COVID-19. Like we didn't have to bat an eye about equipping all of our students with computers when kids went into a remote setting. Other districts were not in the same financial situation. They did not have that type of flexibility. So that's just an example okay. of why we have those funds. It's, it's, like a, a, it's like a rainy day. Yeah. Okay. I just was not fully understanding, but I, 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 I think I made a suggestion that I retract because um, it sounds like at least 2% would be, I mean, just, it's fine the way it is, you know, um, but it, I just, I, I was concerned about, there's a lot of mistrust and if someone were to interpret something as to be withheld from the, the kids and not fully understand it's a rainy day fund and there are going to be problems and, and it's going to be used in those cases. Um, it just helps me explain things to, to people when my little cynical mind reads something and, and it's, it's not the mind I generally use, but I talk to it, <laughs> I guess. So, so, so Rhett, for, for a comparison, the education fund, which is what we get our largest amount of revenue from at our district, the statewide education fund, uh, the legislature, um, I believe it's in statute, uh, has a 5%. Um, they take 5% of that fund and that amount of spending and make sure that that's available as a reserve. And in the middle of COVID-19, or really kind of like once COVID-19 hit and we had a lot of businesses close, sales and use tax, 100% of our sales and use tax goes into the education fund and those revenues dipped off. And meals and rooms tax, 25% of those revenues dipped off. So the legislature took that reserve fund and used it to make sure that schools were able to, to stay open and pay for all their services. That was drained, but the economy bounced back really quickly because there was a large injection of federal funds and Vermont did very well in terms of weathering this economically. And so that reserve fund was replenished uh, last fiscal year. So just as an example, you know, the legislature keeps an even larger reserve to help schools and it was used just in the past couple of years. Okay. And um, those, these types of questions can just be asked in the committee meeting. I can get clarifications in committee meetings. Once I start that, that'll be a better, maybe a better use of our time. I, I don't, I'm really cognizant of the time um, and trying to get squared away in an efficient way. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. Well, can I say something? I, I think Rhett, it's really, really important that the questions that you have are questions that people and the public will also have. So don't, I think that it's really important. I think that's something, now this funds is back to the policy committee, right? Is this my understanding? Yeah. Uh, no, it just, we yeah, it's just for, yeah. We can, we will just schedule it for another okay. reading. Yeah. For another reading? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, we'll these talk about These are good it. points to think about that. Right, like the process procedurally, it's important for everyone to know that this is going to go back to the policy committee and then going to back, come back to the full board for a second reading and then back to the policy committee and then back to the board for a third reading. So the way that it used to work was it would only go back to the policy committee. It doesn't committee. go back to the policy committee. If, 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 the, if, if the board referred it back, yeah. like if the board was like, we need to do more work on this. This right. board member has this concern. This board member would like to see this change. Yeah. Board agrees. Let's send this back to the policy committee. Let's make these changes. Let's give this a little more thought. Okay. But unless we refer no it back, changes, it stays here. But it will still be at two more meetings. Yep. Yes. In front of us to discuss and field public comment and questions. So we have lots of time with these policies. Exactly. It just gives time, so it's out there. So we, yeah. For instance, yeah. That's what I brought up my point about not needing to read first read because the reason you have three readings is so you right. can catch mistakes like that. Yep. Like, oh, like this should have been changed or, oh, someone has a suggestion. Yeah. So it, you know, I, it was fine that we did it that way, but the idea is to keep it out there so people, you know, 
read it one of the three times um, yeah. at least so, and catch any you know catch any you know errors or commit comments. I wonder if we could have a, a make it a point to put in front porch form uh, and on the friends of Facebook like every time we're gonna have a policy reading just because nobody goes in chat. And I think like those would be good practice like I mean I, I think it would be great for a board member to do that and any board member I, I already volunteered and I yeah, did the front porch forum posting this week but I didn't mention policies. I mentioned okay. the, the Central Vermont Career Center instead. Yeah. And, okay. and okay. pretty much like 30 minutes after I had said that was like yeah. policy. Well and we should so, talk about that at the last meeting about just maybe posting the agendas. Can you link? Yes. Yeah, yeah I put a link to the agenda. I did yeah, I just um, in my narrative to draw people in. Yeah. Yeah. The hook. My yes, exactly. The marketing I was doing. I sent I focused on Central Vermont Career Center and yes. policy. Right. Next time I will do policy. Okay. okay. Thank you for doing and that. Then, so I can say Con, do you want to just send me what you're writing and I'll just put it on the Facebook friends of Montpelier? I can do both. Okay. I can do both. It's just as easy. Great. Great. And and Rep, with this particular policy, this one. And, and we're planning to do this with different policies that fall within the jurisdiction of different committees. So like our equity policy will go to our equity committee. These policies both went to our finance committee. We reviewed them at our last finance committee meeting. We discussed them with Grant. Then we sent them back over to the policy committee. Policy committee reviewed them. And then they came to the board. Okay. So... I'm just a little behind. I'll catch up. I, I, you're, you're doing great. Yeah, yeah, no, you're definitely doing great. So did we vote on, we haven't voted yet to move from the second reading. We're still in discussion, no. aren't we? We have a motion and, and a second and- We're in discussion. We're in discussion. Yes, any other discussion or questions? Otherwise we can vote. Let's vote. Let's vote. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We will move on to a second reading. Um, I need a motion to go into executive session for, person, for purpose of personnel discussion. Anakin. <laughs> Do we need the no, we don't one? need the magic words. We just need. Okay. We just need, okay. I just move need that motion. we enter into executive session for the purposes of personnel discussion. Um, discussing the second. personnel matter. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. You have a volunteer to bring a Libby head in with us, and I guess you too as well. I can uh, I can bring it because I don't have a computer. Oh, all we need is one person to bring their computer and to log into Zoom, and then I can put that person in a breakout session with me.